We begin week three of our corporate finance class uh, talking about capital fundraising. We're gonna complete our discussion of stocks, do a little bit of work with stocks and bonds to determine cost of capital and begin our discussion of capital budgeting leading into case number two, which will be posted next this coming Sunday, February 20th. Case number two is a spreadsheet capital budget analysis, bringing back our old days of being in finance and accounting. And we'll talk more about that in our Friday video. But uh, for now, uh, many of you are still working on your uh, case number one and uh, you're on extension. And please make sure you get that in to me this week. And then I can get the grades posted by the end of the week and, and return to you. Uh, our subject today is again, as I said, uh, stocks. Uh, what is a... Uh, What's the difference between a stock and a bond? Uh, those are the two main for, uh, funds uh, fundraising capabilities of corporations is issuing bonds in the corporate bond market and issuing stocks in the equity and public markets or private stocks in the private market to venture capitalists and hedge funds. But what those are, because they are the key determinant of the fundraising to invest in assets and generate revenues in return for our investors. So how you go about fundraising and getting the capital is very important. So to start off our lecture video, here's a quick and somewhat uh, mundane, <laughs> bad choice of words, uh, video uh, explaining stocks and bonds. And uh, let's take a look at it. In this video, I will show you stocks versus bonds, differences, and risk in detail, so let's start. In the world of investments, you'll often hear about stocks and bonds. They are both feasible forms of investment. They allow you the opportunity to invest your money with a specific company or corporation with the possibility of future profits. But how exactly do they work? And what are the differences between the two? Bonds? Let's start with bonds. The easiest way to define a bond is through the concept of a loan. When you invest in bonds, you are essentially loaning your money to a company, corporation, or government of your choosing. That institution, in turn, will give you a receipt for your loan, along with a promise of interest in the form of a bond. Bonds are bought and sold in the open market. Fluctuation in their values occurs depending on the interest rate of the general economy. Basically, the interest rate directly affects the worth of your investment. For instance, if you have a $1,000 bond that pays the interest of 5 cents yearly, you can sell it at a higher face value provided the general interest rate is below 5%. And if the rate of interest rises above 5%, the bond, though it can still be sold, is usually sold at less than its face value. The logic behind this system is that the investors deal with a higher rate of interest than the actual bond pays. Thus, the bond is sold at a lower value in order to offset the gap. The IC market, which is comprised of banks and security firms, is the favorite trading place for bonds because corporate bonds can be listed on the stock exchange and can be purchased through stockbrokers. With bonds, unlike stocks, you, as the investor, will not directly benefit from the success of the company or the amount of its profits. Instead, you will receive a fixed rate of return on your bond. Basically, this means that whether the company is wildly successful or has an abysmal year of business, it will not affect your investment. Your bond return rate will be the same. Your return rate is the percentage of the original offer of the bond. This percentage is called the coupon rate. It is also important to remember that bonds have maturity dates. Once a bond hits its maturity date, the principal amount paid for that bond is returned to the investor. Different bonds are issued with different maturity dates. Some bonds can have up to 30 years of maturity period. When dealing in bonds, the greatest investment risk that you face is the possibility of the principal investment amount not being paid back to you. Obviously, this risk can be somewhat controlled through the careful assessment of the companies or institutions that you choose to invest in. Those companies that possess more creditworthiness are generally safer investments when it comes to bonds. The best example of a safe bond is the government bond. Another is the blue chip company bond. 
blue chip companies are well-established companies that have proven and successful track records over a long span of time. Of course, such companies will have lower coupon rates. If you're willing to take a greater risk for better coupon rates, then you would probably end up choosing the companies with low credit ratings, companies that are unproven or unstable. Keep in mind, there's a great risk of default on the bonds from smaller corporations. However, the other side of the coin is that bondholders of such companies are preferential creditors. They get compensated before the stockholders in the event of a business going bankrupt. So, for less risk, choose to invest in bonds from established companies. You will be likely to cash in on your returns, but they will probably not be very large. Or, you can choose to invest in smaller, unproven companies. The risk is greater, but if it pays off, your bank account will be greater, too. As in any investment venture, there's a trade-off between the risk and the possible rewards of bonds. Stocks. Stocks represent shares of a company. These shares give part of the ownership of the company to you. The shareholder. Your stake in the company is defined by the amount of shares that you, the investor, own. Stock comes in mid-caps, small caps, and large caps. As with bonds, you can decrease the risk of stock trading by choosing your stocks carefully, assessing your investments, and weighing the risk of different companies. Obviously, an entrenched and well-known corporation is much more likely to be stable than a new and unproven one, and the stock will reflect the stability of the companies. Stocks, unlike bonds, fluctuate in value and are traded in the stock market. Their worth is based directly on the performance of the company. If the company is doing well, growing, and attaining profits, then so does the value of the stock. If the company is weakening or failing, the stock of the company decreases in value. There are various ways in which stocks are traded. In addition to being traded like shares of a company, stock can also be traded in the form of options, which is a type of futures trading. Stock can also be sold and brought in the stock market on a daily basis. The value of a certain stock can increase and decrease according to the rise and fall in the stock market. Because of this, investing in stocks is much riskier than investing in bonds. Both stocks and bonds can become profitable investments, but it is important to remember that both options also carry a certain amount of risk. Being aware of that risk and taking steps to minimize it and control it, not the other way around, will help you to make the right choices when it comes to your financial decisions. The key to wise investing is always good research, a solid strategy, and guidance you can trust. That's all in this video. Okay, that uh, gentleman certainly had an obnoxious voice. Uh, glad that's over with. But at the same time, that was a good basic understanding of the bond and stock market, and especially the key word that we've been talking about the first few weeks of our course, risk how you, the risk of the investment, naturally stocks have a greater risk because you are an owner. You're subject to the, the liabilities and, and good things and bad things about a company's performance, whereas a bond, you're guaranteed that as a creditor or a lender to that institution. And last week we talked about uh, how, to, how bonds, as it's mentioned in the video, go up and down with inter market interest rates. We saw that present value calculation in our spreadsheet. This week, we're going to take a look at now stocks and how to determine their value. How, what's the key uh, analytical numbers behind a stock? Because again, we're leading into cost of capital. A lot like many of the work that you did on case number one is to determine the risk of that specific company that you designated in, in your beginning of a, this course. What's key determinant of risk? It's relationship to the market. Risk-free interest rate, the 10-year United States Treasury bond, the, actual, the current market stock market return of the S&P 500, and the beta and the specific risk of your company. All that plays into the required rate of return are the return necessary for this for your company to compete in the market to attract investors, all based on relative risk in the market. And then the risk in the market of other factors involving your company, organizational risk, environmental risk, market risk, 
liability issues. All these add up to risk. And as a company, as a corporate finance manager, those risks determine how much that money, how much it's going to cost you to get capital to grow and to provide assets. As an investor, it shows you your risk of whether you'll win or lose in that investment. And that's all our discussions of this week. So now I would like to go to, if you, as you can see in front of you, your, our Blackboard site in week number three. Um, we now have some interesting tidbits. There's a, another video about stocks and bonds that some of you who are new to this might want to see. Uh, there's a, an explanation of, of bonds and stocks. Uh, the definition of equity financing, which a lot of you know from the capital asset pricing model, and uh, some PowerPoints and some of the other material in that regard. But the thing I'm going to concentrate now is this week three lectured notes. I'm going to be talking about this today in our lecture and also again in our Friday lecture. So let's take a look at that spreadsheet. Okay, here's uh, that spreadsheet from week number two, and it just defines the key uh, areas of stock. And again, many of you probably know this, but I'm just going over it for some of our students. It's been a while and taking a look at this. First of all, a stock is, is returned to you in two forms, a dividend, and that dividend can be a cash dividend, getting a check, could be a stock dividend. They could pay you stock instead of dividend instead of cash. That's a payout to the investor as a reward, a bad choice of word, as a return on their uh, ownership of the stock in the company. Another area of return is naturally the price of the stock can go up. That's called capital gain. If you sell the stock at a higher value than what you purchased it for, that's a capital gain and, the, and the, you have a positive return. Why does the stock price go up? Well, it's the performance of the company. It's the uh, current market. If the overall market or the industry that that company represents is all up, uh, that makes the stock price go up. Also, consumer confidence. If the, if the general consumer or investor is very confident in the future, that's going to bid up the price of stock. Remember, stock is simply more than supply and demand. The stock price will go up on a stock if there's more demand than the supply. If there's more people wanting to buy the stock than willing to sell it, that'll force the stock price up. If there's more people wanting to sell the stock, than wanting to buy it, that forces the stock down. That's why when the market, when the markets go down and big periods of stock drop, that's when more people are trying to sell stock and there's less people trying to buy the stock. That forces the stock price down until equilibrium achieves in the marketplace. When the buyers and the sellers are equal, that's the selling price of the stock. So it's a, it's a supply and demand market. Remember, bonds pay interest and your principal back, and it's guaranteed. It's You're a creditor, you're a lender to the company. Stocks are basically ownership in a company. It's expectations, what you expect the stock to do in the future. Also, what you expect the stock to do in the future relative to the overall market. Is this a good time to buy equity? Is it a good time to buy ownership? That will force a higher value of stock and the price. For example, if somebody says, what's the current dividend yield on a stock? Well, the dividend yield is the current 12-month dividend being paid on the stock divided by the stock price that you purchased that stock at. So if the stock price is at $20 a share and you get a $4 a year dividend, $4 as a percent of $20, of, uh, $20 is 20%. So your dividend yield is 20, 20%. What do we mean by capital gain? Well, the return on a stock, as I mentioned earlier, is dividend yield plus capital gain. What's an example of capital gain? Going back to the $2, a $20 a share stock price here. If the stock price currently is $22 and I decide to sell, that means I would get a $2 capital gain, uh, making $2 more profit than I would uh, on the sale of the stock. I bought it for 20, I sell it for 22. 2% or $2 divided by the $20 purchase price, I would have a capital gain of 10%. So that's what all that means. 
Now, naturally, in the real world, if you sell a stock and you get a $2 gain, some of that gain is going to be paid to the broker or the firm representing you in the transaction. So you would, you would get probably less than 2%, I mean, $2. Uh, currently, the average trading fees is anywhere to a half a percent to to one or two percent of the transaction. It depends on the broker, depends on the services the broker is giving you. Now, here's another uh, explanation, and this is talked about uh, a lot in stock, is how can, I, how can I compare the current stock price to what the market thinks the stock price is? In other words, is this stock, its current value, is it, does it match what this company should be doing? In other words, the intrinsic value. And there's a very famous model used in finance called the constant growth model. The constant growth model is defined as taking the next first, the future dividend of the next year and dividing that dividend by the expected return minus the expected growth of the stock. And if you do that, you can get it, you can get your, the current intrinsic value. Now there's a one flaw in this model. It assumes that the growth is constant. Well, in most cases, most companies' growth are not constant. They're not the same every year. But still, this model kind of gives you a snapshot of today of what the stock looks like. Remember, future dividend, what does the company expect to pay in the next year and expected growth. How does the company expect to grow this year? Both those pieces of information have to be supplied by the company of the stock. In other words, every quarter, the CFO of a company, <coughs> excuse me, goes to the public and has to, required by law, by the SEC, to show their next 10 months return expectations. What they and figure out what they anticipate paying as a dividend in the next 12 months and what they expect the return or the growth rate of the company to be. That's required by law. So you can use those as a guesstimate. Now, the good thing about that is, is the company surprise it, provides that information. Now, the bad thing is it's future. It does, we don't not, not know for sure it's going to happen, but companies have to stake their reputation and their brands on the quality of their efficiency in projecting these things. And that's why it's a very important companies that do this well and very, very rarely directly in, in these uh, future outcast or future forecasts compared to what actually happened are the companies you want to invest in. Now, let's say I have a company that's going back to this $20 uh, example of a stock. Let's say they currently pay a 50 cent a share dividend right now. So their current yield is two and a half percent, 50 cents as a percentage of $20. Now, the company has told us that they expect the company to grow by 7%. That means their dividend rate will grow by 7% in the next year. And let's say I do a capital asset pricing model, just like you did in case number one, taking the interest, risk-free interest rate, adding it to the market premium times the risk or the beta of the company. And you determine that the expected return of the investors is 9%. So if I take a 7% increase, that's the growth rate of the dividend, in other words, 50 cents times a 7% growth. So that means rounding off, they'll pay a 54 cent dividend in this next future year. If I take that 54 cents and divide it by the expected return by the capital asset pricing model of 9% minus the expected growth that the company plans on doing seven, I can get what the stock price is intrinsically valued at today. In other words, 54 cents divided by 2% gives me $27 a share. Now let's say I go to my stockbroker on the same day and I say, Mr. Broker, what's the current price of this company stock in the market? And my broker says that the current price is $30 today. The current price is $30. And I'm saying that the stock price is $27, its intrinsic value today based on the constant growth model. Now, as an investor, would you buy this stock based on this analysis today from your broker? The answer is no. Why would I pay, why would I buy a stock for $30 today when its value is $27? This stock is greatly 
is overvalued in the market. In other words, its true price based on its expected return and its risk in the market and its current dividend yield, it's only worth 27 bucks. The market thinks the stock is overvalued. So I would stay away from that. But if I went to my broker today and my broker said, oh, the stock is currently trading at $27 a share in the market. Well, then I would pull a Warren Buffett. I would immediately tell my broker to buy this stock because I feel it's worth $27 a share. So in the market, the stock price is undervalued. And now I wanna grab as much as I can because if everything holds true with the management of this company in the next year, I will go from $20 to $27 and make some money. The market will adjust to the performance of the company. Now. Again, this is all speculation, it's all estimate, but this is what drives macros, this is what drives trading platforms of many companies. Where are they currently in their constant growth model or intrinsic value compared to the actual value of the market? Remember, the market is supply and demand, as I said earlier. So the market is not really showing an indicator of how well the company specifically is doing or projected to be doing in the next year. It's based on supply and demand. It's, there's other factors. So if the market in this, in the case of we first looked at is overvaluing this company, stay away from it. If it's undervaluing the company, that's when Warren Buffett and those big stock traders, that's when they move in for the kill and buy up a lot of stock. So that's the key indicators about stock and how it's relative to the performance of the company, but also relative to what the market perceives its value. Just take a look at Tesla. Tesla doesn't make much profit. They make some, especially in the last year, but relative to the high market price, oof. take a look at Tesla's price earnings ratio and it'll give you how overvalued that company is. So there's some, there's some examples of stock and what it means relative to bonds. And that's a key thing, get to understand that, because now beginning at the latter part of this week, we're going to talk about a company's cost of capital. All right. What does a company, what, are, what when they decide to invest in a new asset and they have three options of getting money, capital, debt, equity, and profits. What is it going to cost them to go out and get money today in the market? All right. Well, part of that is the cost of equity. What does it cost to issue stock now? Part of it is the cost of debt. What is our credit rating and our borrowing rate in the market? Part of it is how much money do we have in retained earnings or profits and where that money is being invested now? Do we want to pull it out of that investment and invest it in the future? These are all relative to determine what is called the cost of capital. And this is what we're gonna talk about on Friday. And it plays into case number one. Why? It's the risk of the, of the company in the market. If they wanted to get go out and borrow money, what's their credit rating? Are there any factors that could make it a little bit a higher, higher liability in investing in this company? If you're gonna go out into the stock market, what is the market expected return of your company based on the market competition that you're in and your beta? And if you want to use profits and retained earnings, do you want to take that risk of taking money out of one type of investment where that retained earnings is and invest it in the future? These are all risks that we're going to talk about throughout the remaining part of our class and have numerous case studies analyzing it. Case number one was the very first part of understanding and explaining risk. So that's our lecture start off for week number three. We'll pick this up again on our Friday update video. Again, many of you are completing uh, case number one. There's no other graded work this week. Case number two, which will be a spreadsheet work, will be posted next Sunday night, February 20th. And I'll talk more about that on Friday. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Adios.